So we've said in these kind of theories where we have dimensional power counting that dimensional regularization is special. So I want to talk a bit more about dimensional regularization. So sometimes you'll hear people say that you should always use dimensional regularization for doing the power counting, but that's not quite true in the way that I've told you. It's not that you have to, it's just that it makes things simpler. But given that we want to make things as simple as possible, let's take dimensional regularization seriously. So you can actually derive dimensional regularization by just imposing axioms. If you say that you want a loop integration that's linear, I should say, I should have said this earlier. So my notation with dimensional regularization is I put a little cross on the d, and that means dividing by the 2 pi. So it means ddp over 2 pi to the d. So linearity means that if I'm integrating some function that can be decomposed into a sum of two pieces, a and b being constants, f and g being functions, then I can write that out as an integral over f plus an integral over g, which really is something that almost ev every reasonable definition of the integration will satisfy. The second one is translations which is more restricting. So that says if you have some integral over f, but it's a function of p plus q, q is some external, I can always shift away the q, just goes p goes to p minus q, and then I just have an integral over p. And along with translations, you can think about having rotations. My whole, not whole notation is covariant, so we won't worry so much about rotations. And Lorentz group. And then the final one that's kind of obviously a little bit special to Dimreg is a scaling. So let's start, say we have a scalar S multiplying our momentum P. Then we can rescale the, the momentum P and get rid of, pull the S outside by just taking p goes to p over s. So that changes this to a p. We get an s to the minus d that pulls out front. And if we demand that, then that's special to dimensional regularization, because you can see that the, this depends on d. Even if I called this measure some abstract thing, now there's a d showing up. It's outside the measure. And these three together actually give a unique definition to the integration up to the overall normalization. And that unique thing is dim rag. So I'm going to refer to you to reading. I've posted a chapter from Colin's book on regularization. And around page 65, he, talk, he talks about how you prove that. It's not too hard. <clears throat> the, the standard definition of the, the normalization, which is something you have to specify, is that you let, say, this Gaussian integral be pi to the d over 2. So then from that, you have some measure in some space that you can then just use. So one formula that I used earlier on was the ability to split that into pieces which were a radial piece and then an angular piece. 
And in general, this is a property that this integration measure obeys, that you could split it, and you could split it further. You could pull out another angle, for example. And get one less dimension in the angulars parts. And the UV divergences, if we're talking about UV divergences, they're occurring in this radial part, Euclidean radial part. So by thinking about this kind of decomposition, you're moving the UV divergences to a one-dimensional integration, at least at one loop. And you can always do that. So in general, in dimensional regularization, there's many ways you could evaluate the integral. You're not used to using this one. You're used to keeping things covariant, using some Feynman, par Feynman parameters, combining propagators together, and then doing the integral. But you could also do it this way, and you get the same answer. So it's, a, it's really a well-defined measure in the sense that you can manipulate it in different ways, and they should all lead to the same answer for your loop integrals. And that's part of what I'm trying to emphasize by saying that you could derive it by considering axioms. So d was equal to 4 minus 2 epsilon. Epsilon greater than 0 is what you need to lower the powers of p and therefore tame the uv. Epsilon less than 0 can be used to regulate infrared singularities. There's some counterintuitive facts about dimensional regularization, and I want to mention a couple of them to you. One of them is that if I have p to an arbitrary power, think of it as Euclidean, that's 0. So Collins constructs a proof of this on page 71, which is actually a little more involved in general. I'll just give you kind of an idea of what, how you can see that from using our axioms that something like this better be true. So let's consider a special, special example that won't be enough to prove it for arbitrary alpha. This is any alpha. Let's consider a special example that at least will be enough to prove it for integers. So we'll consider k's that are integers, and we'll think of k's that are greater than 0. So if I just expand out this p plus q squared, and the first term is p to the 2k, then I get some coefficient p to the 2k minus 2 q squared, some coefficient p to the 2k minus 4 q to the fourth, et cetera. In general, there's p dot q terms as well, but then I could do integral uh, angular average and combine those together with these terms. Um, that's why I'm not being very explicit about what the coefficients are, but there are some positive numbers. Now, I could also take this integral and I could shift. That was one of our axioms. And that is p to the 2k. So that means that all these terms here better be 0. And they have to be 0 for arbitrary q and arbitrary k. k under the assumptions that we use, which are that it's an integer and it's positive, so I could expand it in this way. And so therefore, we have all these integrals over p to the powers, and they better be 0. And that's enough to prove this for integer alphas, positive integer alphas. Okay. 
And so if you want to fill in between the integers and you want to do the negative cases, then you have to look at Collins. But <laughs> you can do that, too. Then it requires a little more heavy lifting. There's one fact about this, fact number one, which is a little bit subtle and you have to be careful. And it's worth noting. So let me do another example, which is by way of warning you that this can sometimes be dangerous. So let's think of a scalar field theory and a simple loop diagram like this. But let's take zero momentum and zero mass. So if you do that, you'll encounter an integral that looks like this. There's two propagators, so I get a p to the fourth downstairs, and I get ddp. And that integral is 0, but it's 0 in a special way. It's 0 due to a cancellation between ultraviolet and infrared physics. I said that epsilon could be regulating both infrared divergences as well as ultraviolet divergences. If I only used epsilon to regulate ultraviolet divergences, I'd get a 1 over epsilon uv. But in this integral, I'm actually using it to do both. It's regulating an infrared divergence as well, and it just comes in with the opposite sign and sends epsilon uv is equal to epsilon ir. They're just notation to signify what region of physics is giving the divergence. You get 0. But even though that's true, that doesn't mean you don't have to add a counterterm for this diagram, because counterterms are supposed to cancel ultraviolet divergences, not infrared ones. OK? So even though it's 0, you still need to add a counterterm. Because the 0 is actually a cancellation between ultraviolet and infrared physics. So there's some counterterm. And it would be exactly of this sort, because this is the epsilon uv. And then if you add the bare diagram plus the counter term, the answer is non-zero. You've canceled, if you like, the UV pole, and you've left over the IR pole. OK, so you have to be a bit, bit careful about using dimensional regularization, because if you encounter scaleless integrals, it could be that they actually are affecting counter terms. And if you want to do some renormalization group improvement of the theory or something like that, you have to be aware of this. If you know that all the infrared poles are going to cancel because you're looking at some infrared safe quantity, then you can be a little glib about this. Because if they're going to cancel in the end, that means that any of these corresponding UV poles will also cancel. But it's not always the case that you're renormalizing operators that, are, uh, that are, have no 1 over epsilon IRs. And then you have to be careful about this. So this is a subtlety that sometimes people get wrong when they write papers. So dim reg is beautiful, but there's some things about it that are a little bit tricky. Another thing that can be confusing about dim reg is that it does this, that it regulates both UV and IR poles. And even though it's doing that, and even though you need different values of epsilon if you want to do that, it's actually still a well-defined procedure, even in the presence of UV and IR, IR poles, even if they're both in the same integral. And basically, you're using analytic continuation here. So let me give you a little example, which is not exactly related to this, but will allow me to show you both how you use analytic continuation and how you could think about separating UV and IR poles. So we'll start out just by thinking about analytic continuation. So suppose I had some integral So what does an analytic continuation mean? Or how should I construct it? So let me again write it in a way where I've separated out the radial integral 
And let's suppose that this integral here is perfectly well defined for d in some range. So this is well defined. for some range of positive d. And then let's say that we wanted to continue that integral to negative d. And the problem with negative d may be that when you get to negative d, you're getting some infrared divergences. And you have to figure out how to deal with them. And you can do this, if you like, step by step. So if we wanted to extend the lower limit down to minus 2 from 0, then we would do the following. We take our integral, write it out in this angular radial separation. split up in the, in the radial variable the piece that's ultraviolet, which is the high momentum piece, from the piece that's infrared. And in the piece that's infrared, we could also just do some addition and sub subtraction to make it more convergent as p goes to 0. So for example, we could subtract f at 0. This thing would fall off faster, and hence give more powers of p. And we could make it more convergent at, at 0. And then we just integrate the subtraction up to the cutoff, c. And the idea of introducing this cutoff c is that we split the UV piece and the ultraviolet piece. And so we can do one kind of continuation for d up here, making epsilon positive, one kind of continuation down here. And the result when we put these back together is independent of c. Okay, So that's the sense, actually, in which what I said up here is that you can use it for both UV and IR divergences, because you could always introduce some parameter c to split. They're occurring in different regions of phase space, so you could always split them up regulate each one with different values of d, and then put them back together. And the answer, when you put them back to together, is independent of c. OK. Now, if you wanted to define, that was one of our goals. The other one was just to show you what you mean by analytic continuation. So since it's independent of c, then you could do the following. So for minus 2 less than d less than 0, let's take c goes to infinity. And so for that particular range, what you find then, if you take that limit, Well, because of the c to the minus d, the c is downstairs if d is negative. So that, that term goes away. And you're just left with this term. This term here goes away, too, because c approaches the upper limit, and everything's regulated. And so I just would be left with that. Okay, Making d negative is, okay, so that would be the definition. So you can see you know, some of the kind of tricks that you could use with dimensional regularization are like adding and subtracting terms. And these are things that are valid things to do. Any questions about that? OK. So when we do dimensional regularization in MS bar, you're used to doing that for a gauge theory. That's what you've learned about. But you can also do it for any effective field theory. And the logic is the same. So let me remind you of the gauge theory logic and then just tell you how you would define MS bar precisely for 
the, the fermionic effective theory with the psi bar psi squared operator that we had. So we talked about dimensional organization. Let's talk about the MS scheme. So if we've set up our effective theory in a way where we've made the mass scale uh, explicit, which is often a nice thing to do, and we did that when we set up the effective theory where we had the capital M showing up explicitly. If you do that, then the couplings start out dimensionless. And that's a nice thing to have dimensionless coupling. And the MS scheme is simply the scheme where you want to introduce a scale to keep the renormalized couplings dimensionless. So the example you're familiar with is just having a gauge coupling. And if you go through the dimensions of the fields here, which I do in my notes, but I'm going to assume that you've got some familiarity with this, you find that the bare coupling has dimension epsilon. And so you define a renormalized coupling that's dimensionless. And you introduce a factor of mu to the epsilon. So you say g bare, which has dimensions, some dimensionless z factor, some mu to the epsilon to make up those dimensions, and then left over is the renormalized coupling. And the idea and the strategy for any other coupling in the effective theory is the same. So let's do one other example. So take our dimension 6, a bear over capital M squared, psi bar psi squared. Do dimension counting on this guy. which I do again in the notes. But if you go through that dimension counting and you remember that the dimensions for the fermions are assigned by the kinetic term, so we have a dimension counting for the fermions. We know that this is dimension minus 2. The old thing has to add up to d. So that tells us what the a bare is. And we get 4 minus d in this case. And so then we can write down a formula analogous to that one, but for the a coefficient. And it's mu to the 2 epsilon. OK? So it's as simple as that. So we're looking at the action where this is a term in the Lagrangian. We want to ensure that when we go to the normal that we figure out the dimensions of this guy in dimensional organization. That's 4 minus d, which we determine from knowing the other pieces here. And then we just make a redefinition to give a, renormal, a dimensionless coupling. So that's how MS bar will work. Well, this is MS, but this is how minimal subtraction works for defining all the operators that you may have. And minimal subtraction is simply a rescaling. And that's the same as it is in gauge theory, where we get rid of some annoying factors and use a slightly different definition. So this is MS and this is MS bar. OK, so it really works in a very similar way to gauge theory. And you, do the, you figure out the factors of mu to the epsilon to include in your calculation this way. Sometimes you see books do it by saying the loop integral, the loop measure is continued with a mu to the epsilon. That's not right. This is right. If you do that, you'll get into trouble. Not always. That's why the books can get away with it. But in general, you'll get into trouble. All right. So we should stop there.